In June 1905, a 26-year-old Albert Einstein wrote a scientific paper about a problem with light that had bothered him since he was a teenager. When the editor, Max Planck, read it, he realized that Einstein had completely changed our understanding of space and time. This young Swiss patent clerk had challenged the traditional ideas we had about the world. Einstein's problem began with a discovery by James Clerk Maxwell in the 1800s. Maxwell found a way to combine electricity and magnetism into something called the electromagnetic field. If you've ever felt the tingle in the air before a storm or the shock when taking off a sweater, you've sensed this field. Maxwell also showed that light is a type of electromagnetic wave traveling at a constant speed. Here's where Einstein's puzzle started. What if you could catch up with a beam of light? According to the common sense of Newton's laws of motion, you should be able to make light stand still. But according to Maxwell's theory, this was impossible. No one had ever seen a stationary light. Einstein thought deeply about this issue, not knowing that other physicists were struggling with the same problem. In this video, we'll explore how Einstein solved this puzzle with his special theory of relativity. This theory changed our ideas about space and time by explaining how the world looks to people moving relative to each other. It may sound like a small intellectual exercise, but Einstein's ideas about observers chasing light have profound implications for understanding how even ordinary situations appear to people in motion. In everyday life, we don't usually notice that our observations of the world can differ based on our perspective. For example, when driving, trees seem to move past a driver but appear still to a hitchhiker on the roadside. Special relativity, however, suggests that these differences are more profound than we might think. Special relativity claims that people in relative motion will perceive distance and time differently. This means that if two individuals with identical wristwatches are moving relative to each other, their watches will tick at different rates, and they won't agree on how much time has passed. Similarly, if they have identical tape measures, they won't agree on the lengths of measured distances. While these effects are usually very small in our everyday experiences, they become noticeable at extremely high speeds, such as a substantial fraction of the speed of light. For instance, if someone were to travel at 87% of the speed of light, their measurements of time and distance would differ significantly from those of a stationary observer. Even though these effects are tiny at the speeds we encounter in our daily lives, they challenge the idea of universal and unchanging space and time. In situations where speeds are close to that of light, these effects would be intuitive. But since we don't experience such speeds regularly, understanding and accepting them require us to rethink our understanding of the world. The foundation of special relativity involves two important ideas. One is about the properties of light, which we'll discuss later. The other is more abstract and is called the principle of relativity. This principle says that when we talk about the speed or velocity of an object, we must specify who is measuring it. This becomes clear when we consider a situation involving two space dwellers, George and Gracie. Imagine George floating in empty space with a red flashing light, seeing a green flashing light attached to Gracie, approaching. From George's perspective, he feels stationary, and Gracie seems to be moving. Gracie's viewpoint, however, is the opposite. Both perspectives are valid, and neither is more right than the other. This example illustrates the principle of relativity, stating that the concept of motion is relative. To say something is moving, we need to compare it to something else. There's no absolute notion of motion. The story emphasizes that this concept applies even when the observers are not influenced by external forces, allowing them to feel constant velocity motion. If external forces are involved, the feeling of motion changes. The example is set in empty space to remove familiar objects, but the principle applies to everyday situations. For instance, 
When, on a moving train passing another train, it can be challenging to determine which is moving without external reference points. If the ride is smooth and constant, you may observe relative motion without knowing which train is moving. Einstein extended this idea to closed compartments, stating that within such a compartment, with no view outside, it's impossible to determine constant velocity motion. The principle asserts that force-free motion has meaning only by comparison with other objects. Einstein went further, claiming that the laws of physics must be the same for all observers in constant velocity motion. If George and Gracie are conducting experiments in their respective space stations, the results will be identical even if the stations are in relative motion. This concept establishes symmetry between observers and is at the core of the principle of relativity. The second important idea in special relativity involves the properties of light and how it moves. Unlike the claim that we need a specific benchmark for measuring the speed of an object, experiments have consistently shown that everyone agrees light travels at 670 million miles per hour, regardless of the observer's perspective. To grasp the significance of this, let's compare it to how we perceive the motion of everyday objects. If someone throws a ball, a hand grenade, or if an avalanche approaches, running away from them would decrease the perceived speed. However, with light, it's different. Imagine your friend swapping a grenade for a powerful laser. If she shoots the laser towards you and you measure its speed, you'll find it's 670 million miles per hour. Now, if you run away, based on traditional views, you might expect the measured speed to decrease. However, experiments and analysis have consistently shown that even if you're moving away from the source of light, you'll still measure its speed as 670 million miles per hour. Experiments with light, as described, can't be done directly due to technological limitations, but similar experiments with binary stars have confirmed the constancy of light speed. Various experiments over the past century testing the speed of light in different situations have consistently verified this constancy. This property of light, where its speed remains the same regardless of the motion of the source or the observer, was initially hard for physicists to accept. However, Einstein embraced it because it resolved a conflict that had troubled him since his teenagers. The constancy of light's speed signaled a significant departure from Newtonian physics. In essence, no matter how fast you move, you can't change the apparent speed of light. It always remains at 670 million miles per hour. This realization marked a crucial breakthrough in the understanding of the nature of light and motion. Speed is the measure of how far an object travels in a given time. If we're in a car going 65 miles per hour, it means we'll cover 65 miles in an hour. Speed is closely linked to our ideas about space and time. Einstein's revolutionary insight involves the constant speed of light. Traditional intuition suggests that if an object is moving away, the speed of light from it would appear slower. However, experiments show that light always travels at the same speed, regardless of the motion of its source or the observer. Now let's explore how this constant speed of light affects our understanding of time. Imagine two presidents signing an agreement using a light bulb placed equidistant between them. If they are on a moving train, the observers on the train see the light reaching both presidents simultaneously. However, observers on a platform see a different sequence because of the relative motion. This challenges our common belief in universal simultaneity. In the real world, observers in relative motion won't agree on events happening at the same time. This effect is usually negligible at everyday speeds, but at extremely high speeds, the peculiar effects of special relativity become significant. Time is a challenging concept to define abstractly. Instead of getting into complex definitions, we can take a practical approach and say that time is what clocks measure. Clocks, in this context, 
are devices that go through regular cycles of motion. We measure time by counting these cycles. For example, a wristwatch is a clock, and we measure time by counting the number of times its hands move. Now let's explore how motion affects the passage of time. We focus on clocks that have a simple design to better understand this. One such clock is a light clock that consists of two mirrors facing each other with a photon of light bouncing back and forth between them. We use this light clock to examine how motion influences the ticking of clocks. Imagine watching a stationary light clock, and suddenly another light clock moves by at a constant speed. The question is whether the moving light clock will tick at the same rate as the stationary one. To answer this, consider the path the photon in the moving clock takes from our perspective. The photon has to travel a longer path because the moving clock is, well, moving. Even though both photons travel at the same speed, the moving clock's photon has to cover more distance, so it ticks less frequently. This implies that from our perspective, the moving clock ticks more slowly than the stationary one, and time seems to pass more slowly for the moving clock. This conclusion doesn't only apply to light clocks, it extends to all clocks, including familiar oneies, like Rolex watches or grandfather clocks, if we attach a Rolex to a light clock and set them in motion. Both the light clock and the Rolex will tick more slowly compared to their stationary counterparts. The precise difference in ticking rates depends on how fast the moving clock is traveling. The faster the clock moves, the slower it appears to tick. However, these effects are tiny at everyday speeds. It's only when objects approach speeds close to the speed of light that these distortions become significant. For us who travel at much slower speeds, these effects are generally unnoticed. The constant speed of light means that a clock in motion ticks more slowly than a stationary clock. This isn't just true for light clocks, but for any clock, which means time itself moves more slowly for someone in motion. Muons, normally lasting about two millionths of a second, live much longer when moving close to the speed of light. At 99.5% of light speed, their lifespan can increase by a factor of about 10. According to special relativity, the muons wristwatches a metaphor for their internal processes, tick more slowly in motion. So, even though lab clocks say they should have disintegrated, their internal processes haven't caught up, making them appear to live longer. Although lab observers see fast-moving moons living longer, this is due to time passing more slowly for them. Everything in the moons' lives, including activities like reading books, also slows down. So, while they appear to live longer from our perspective— the amount of life they experience is the same. If people could move as fast as these muons, their life expectancy would also increase, but their experience of life would feel normal to them. From our viewpoint, it would seem like they're living in slow motion. Einstein's theory of relativity says that motion is relative, meaning it depends on your perspective. Let's take the previous example of two people, George and Gracie in space with clocks. If they move relative to each other, their clocks seem to run at different speeds. This is because motion affects time. Now, if George and Gracie move apart and then come back together, comparing their clocks directly is tricky. It turns out that if they communicate through cell phones, the delay in signal travel time makes their perspectives compatible. Each thinks the other's clock is slower. In a specific example, if George travels at 99.5% of the speed of light, waits for three years, and then catches up with Gracie, 60 years will have passed on her clock, but only six on his. This is time dilation in action. Even though it sounds paradoxical, it's consistent within the rules of relativity. The key is that communication isn't instant. George and Gracie's perceptions of time make sense when accounting for the time it takes for signals to travel. This might sound strange, but it's how the universe works according to Einstein's theory. When things move very fast, like cars or spaceships, time and space act in strange ways. Imagine Slim and Jim racing cars on a drag strip. Slim, in a speeding car, 
measures its length with a tape measure when it's still. But for Jim, who watches the moving car, measuring is trickier. He uses a stopwatch, starting when the front passes and stopping when the back passes. By multiplying time with speed, he finds the length. Because of how time works at high speeds, Slim sees Jim's stopwatch running slow. So when Jim calculates the length, he gets a shorter result than Slim measured when the car was still. This happens because, due to time differences, Jim's measurement seems shorter. In a nutshell, when things move fast, observers see them as shorter in the direction they're moving. This is a strange effect of both time and space acting differently at high speeds, according to Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein's theory says that the speed of light is always the same, and it changes how we think about space and time. When things move fast, they seem to age more slowly and appear shorter. Imagine a car going at a fixed speed. If Slim drives at an angle, the time it takes to cover a distance increases, and this is because the car shares its speed between moving sideways and moving forward. Now, Einstein's big idea is that everything in the universe always travels at the speed of light, but it's split between space and time. When something is still, all its motion is through time, and it ages like everything else. But if it moves through space, some of its motion through time is used for motion through space. This means it ages more slowly compared to something not moving. If something moves at the maximum speed through space, it doesn't age at all. It's like a car driving only north or south. Light travels at this maximum speed through space and doesn't age, making it timeless. So Einstein's theory links speed, aging, and the way objects move through space and time. It's a bit mind-bending, but helps explain how the universe works in a whole new way. Einstein theory, even though he preferred calling it invariance, showed that things like space and time, which seemed separate, are actually connected and depend on each other. One key idea he introduced is the famous equation E equal mc square, saying energy, E, and mass, m, are linked. You can convert one into the other, like changing dollars to francs, but the exchange rate is fixed and involves the speed of light. This equation also explains why nothing can go faster than light. Imagine trying to speed up something like a muon. As it gets faster, it becomes more massive, making it harder to accelerate further. At almost the speed of light, it would take an infinite amount of energy to go faster. This impossibility is a fundamental limit set by Einstein's theory. This discovery later clashed with Newton's theory of gravity, marking a significant shift in our understanding of the universe. Isaac Newton, born in 1642 in England, was a brilliant scientist who changed how we understand the world. One of his major contributions was the universal theory of gravity, which explains how things are attracted to each other. Gravity is the force that keeps us on the ground holds the air around the Earth, and controls the movements of celestial bodies like the moon and planets. Before Newton, people didn't realize that the force pulling an apple to the ground is the same force that keeps planets in orbit. Newton said, everything attracts everything else with gravity, no matter what it's made of. He figured out that the strength of this attraction depends on two things, the amount of matter, mass, in the objects and the distance between them. He wrote equations that mathematically describe how strong this gravitational force is. Newton's equations worked really well for predicting the movements of planets, rockets, and even things like baseballs. His theory was a big success until Einstein's discovery of special relativity in the early 1900s, which posed a challenge that Newton's theory couldn't overcome. In special relativity, there's a maximum speed set by light, and nothing, including signals or influences, can travel faster than this speed. 
Unlike slower signals like sound, light always reaches us before any other information it might carry. However, in Newton's theory of gravity, changes in mass or separation between objects instantly affect their gravitational attraction, regardless of how long they've been near each other. For example, if the sun were to explode suddenly, according to Newton, the Earth's orbit would change instantly, even though light from the explosion takes time to reach us. This clashes with special relativity's rule that no information can travel faster than light. Einstein, confident in special relativity, sought a new theory of gravity, leading to his discovery of general relativity in the early 20th century. This new theory transformed our understanding of space and time. Before special relativity was discovered, Newton's theory of gravity could predict how things move under gravity, but couldn't explain what gravity is. Newton acknowledged this gap, saying that he didn't know how gravity works, but provided equations to predict its effects. It's like having an owner's manual for a device without knowing its inner workings. Even though Newton's equations worked well, Einstein realized they were incomplete. In 1907, Einstein, working in a patent office in Bern, Switzerland, had a crucial insight. He imagined a scenario with a bomb rigged to explode if its weight changed. Two assistants raised concerns. As the bomb moved away from Earth, its weight would decrease. But if launched with a rocket, the acceleration would increase its weight. Einstein's revelation was that gravity and acceleration are closely connected. He suggested that carefully adjusting the rocket's acceleration could counteract the changing gravitational effect, keeping the bomb's weight constant. This revealed a profound connection. In a sealed compartment, you can't tell the difference between being accelerated or feeling gravity. Einstein called this the equivalence principle, a key idea in general relativity. General relativity builds on special relativity, uniting gravity and acceleration by introducing the concept of curved space and time. Einstein's happiness came from linking the mysterious force of gravity with the more tangible concept of accelerated motion, using motion to understand gravity better. This insight led to the development of general relativity, transforming our understanding of the universe. Einstein was deeply focused on understanding gravity, even more than his work on special relativity. In 1912, about five years after a crucial revelation, he wrote to physicist Arnold Sommerfeld, expressing the intense challenge he faced in solving the gravity problem. He found gravity more complex than his earlier special relativity theory. Einstein's breakthrough came when he applied special relativity to the link between gravity and accelerated motion. He considered a specific example of accelerated motion, like being on a spinning ride at an amusement park. When observing this ride, he noticed that measurements made by someone on the ride differed from those made by stationary observers. For instance, the circumference of the spinning ride appeared longer to someone on the ride due to a phenomenon called Lorentz contraction, where objects seem shorter in the direction of their motion. Einstein explained this by proposing that space itself is curved, challenging the ancient Greek idea that the ratio of a circle's circumference to its radius is always two times pi. He illustrated this by comparing circles drawn on flat and curved surfaces, showing that the familiar geometry of flat space doesn't apply to an accelerated observer. Einstein concluded that accelerated motion causes both space and time to warp. This means that the geometry we learn from the Greeks doesn't hold for someone on a spinning ride. Einstein extended this idea to propose that gravity itself is the warping of space and time. In simpler terms, he suggested that gravity is not a force between masses, as Newton thought, but rather the result of the curvature of the fabric of space and time itself. This revolutionary concept formed the basis of his general theory of relativity, changing our understanding of gravity profoundly. Let's imagine a planet 
like Earth, orbiting a star such as the Sun. In traditional thinking, Newtonian gravity, it was believed that the Sun somehow reached out across space and held the Earth in orbit. Einstein proposed a different idea. He suggested that space itself responds to the presence of massive objects. In a simplified two-dimensional model, he envisioned space as flat like a smooth table when no mass is around. However, when a massive object, like the sun, is present, it causes space to warp or distort. Think of it like placing a bowling ball on a rubber sheet. The sheet, space, gets distorted around the bowling ball. Now, if you roll a smaller ball bearing, representing, for instance, Earth, on this distorted sheet, it will follow a curved path, an orbit. In this view, gravity is not a mysterious force acting at a distance. Instead, the warping of space by massive objects determines the paths of other objects around them. The more massive an object, the more it distorts space and the stronger its gravitational influence. Also, just as the distortion lessens with distance from the bowling ball, gravity weakens as objects move farther apart. Importantly, Einstein pointed out that all objects, not just big ones like the sun, warp space to some extent, even Earth warps space, orbit on a smaller scale. This concept explains how, according to general relativity, the Earth affects the motion of the moon and keeps everything, including us, anchored to its surface. In summary, Einstein agreed with Newton that gravity requires a cause, and he proposed that the cause is the very fabric of space itself, the way space warps around massive objects. Think of the rubber sheet with the bowling ball analogy as a way for us to picture how space can warp. It helps us understand gravity visually, but it has some limitations. First, unlike the bowling ball pulling the rubber sheet down, massive objects like the sun don't get pulled by anything. Einstein taught us that their mere presence causes space to warp, and this warping is what we call gravity. Objects, like the Earth, move through space along the easiest paths, which become curved when space is warped. So the analogy is good for visualizing, but the actual mechanism is different. Second, the rubber sheet is two-dimensional, but space is three-dimensional. In reality, the sun warps space in all directions, up, down, and sideways. The Earth moves through this fully immersed three-dimensional warped space, don't get confused by the visual, it's just a slice through the full three-dimensional space. Third, the analogy leaves out the time dimension for clarity. In reality, gravity warps both space and time. Although harder to see time, it plays a crucial role. The warping of time has a significant impact on the motion of objects, even more so than the warping of space in certain situations. Einstein's new way of thinking about gravity involves both space and time as dynamic elements. The key question is whether this approach can reconcile with special relativity. And indeed, it does. Imagine space as a rubber sheet and mass as a bowling ball causing the sheet to warp. This warping doesn't happen instantly. It spreads out gradually, much like ripples in a pond. Similarly, when a massive object like the sun warps space, the distortion doesn't happen instantly, but travels outward at the speed of light. So, changes in gravity caused by, for example, the sun's destruction, reach us at the same time we see its effects, about eight minutes later. This concept resolves the conflict with special relativity, ensuring that gravitational disturbances keep pace with the speed of light. Now, let's consider warped time. When near a massive object, time behaves differently due to gravity. Imagine two astronauts, George and Gracie, with synchronized clocks. If George lowers himself toward the sun on a cable, his clock will run slower than Gracie's because of the stronger gravitational field. Gravity not only warps space, but also distorts time. This effect is more significant near denser objects, like neutron stars or black holes, 
where time slows down even more due to stronger gravitational fields. In summary, Einstein's ideas connect gravity, space, and time in a way that aligns with the principles of special relativity, providing a unified understanding of these fundamental forces. Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes gravity as a curvature of both space and time, replaced Newton's simpler view. While Newton's theory worked well for centuries, Einstein's was motivated by the need to address issues with special relativity. In everyday situations, the differences between Newton's and Einstein's gravity are very subtle. Newton's theory was incredibly successful, especially with experiments involving thrown objects or celestial bodies. However, the challenge arose due to Newton's theory suggesting instant gravitational effects, conflicting with special relativity. Einstein proposed a clever experiment using starlight during a solar eclipse to test his theory. According to general relativity, the sun warps space and time, affecting the path of starlight passing close to it. In 1919, an expedition confirmed Einstein's prediction during a solar eclipse, making headlines worldwide and establishing Einstein's fame. While Eddington's confirmation faced later scrutiny, subsequent experiments using advanced technology consistently supported general relativity. It's now clear that Einstein's gravity theory, harmonizing with special relativity, provides predictions more accurate than Newton's. General relativity, a theory developed by Einstein, shows its strength when dealing with very massive objects and severe warps in space and time. Let's explore two examples. The first example involves a discovery by astronomer Carl Schwarzschild during World War I. Using Einstein's general relativity, he found that if a star's mass is concentrated in a small enough region, creating a severe space-time warp, anything, including light, near the star can't escape its gravitational pull. These were later named black holes. Imagine hovering near a black hole's edge, and time would slow down significantly due to its strong gravitational field. This concept allowed for the idea of using black holes as time machines. The second example concerns the entire universe's origin and evolution. Einstein's equations revealed that the universe's overall size must be changing with time, either stretching or shrinking. Initially reluctant to accept this idea, Einstein introduced a cosmological constant to avoid a changing universe. However, Edwin Hubble's observations confirmed the universe's expansion, leading Einstein to acknowledge the expansion as one of his greatest intellectual achievements. As the universe expands, running the clock backward indicates a shrinking cosmos. This backward evolution suggests that the universe began as an extremely dense and hot point, leading to the idea of the Big Bang, a cosmic eruption that initiated the universe's evolution. It's crucial to understand that in the Big Bang there is no surrounding space. The entire universe evolves as a compressed entity with matter and energy carried along by the unfurling of compressed space. At present, experiments haven't shown any deviations from the predictions of general relativity, but future advancements in technology might reveal more. It's essential to test theories with increasing precision to understand nature better. Interestingly, the search for a new theory of gravity began not because of experimental flaws in Newton's theory, but due to its conflict with another theory. Special Relativity. General Relativity emerged as a competing theory, revealing inconsistencies with Newton's theory. Physics has faced a significant theoretical conflict for the past 50 years, similar to the clash between special relativity and Newtonian gravity. General Relativity seems incompatible with another well-tested theory, quantum mechanics, this conflict hinders our understanding of what occurs during significant events like the Big Bang or at the core of a black hole. 
Resolving this conflict is a major challenge in modern theoretical physics, requiring an understanding of basic aspects of quantum theory, which we'll explore next. After their space journey, George and Gracie return to Earth and visit the H-Bar for drinks. George orders his usual papaya juice, and Gracie gets a vodka tonic. As George relaxes with a cigar, it mysteriously disappears from his mouth and reappears on the counter. Perplexed but undeterred, they chalk it up to a mystery. Things get weirder when they notice the ice cubes in their drinks behaving strangely. The cubes in George's papaya juice and Gracie's smaller glass are bouncing around wildly. To their amazement, one ice cube even passes through the side of Gracie's glass without causing any damage. They jokingly attribute it to post-spacewalk hallucinations. In their haste to leave, George and Gracie mistake a painted door for a real one, but the patrons of the H-Bar are accustomed to such oddities. The story concludes by connecting these strange events to the principles of quantum mechanics, suggesting that on a microscopic scale, the behavior observed by George and Gracie is typical of how our universe behaves. Quantum mechanics is a way of understanding the very tiny parts of the universe, like atoms and particles, unlike theories about how things move really fast or are very massive, which can be understood with some effort, quantum mechanics is more confusing. Even experts like Richard Feynman and Albert Einstein found it hard to fully grasp. Feynman once said that while people eventually understood theories about fast and massive things, nobody really understands quantum mechanics. Unlike other scientific ideas where we can logically figure out what happens, quantum mechanics relies on rules and formulas that work well, but are hard to connect with our everyday experiences. This doesn't necessarily mean the universe on a tiny scale is too strange for our minds. It could be that the way scientists have explained quantum mechanics is awkward, and we might find a better way in the future. For now, all we're certain about is that when we focus on the very small, the usual ideas we use to understand the world around us don't work well, and we need a different way of thinking. In the next sections, we'll explore this unique language of quantum mechanics and some surprising things it suggests. Even if it seems weird or confusing, we should remember that we trust quantum mechanics because it predicts things very accurately. And if you find it puzzling, you're not alone. Even famous physicists like Einstein and Niels Bohr had a hard time fully accepting it. The journey to understanding quantum mechanics started with a puzzling problem involving ovens. Imagine a perfectly insulated oven set to a specific temperature like 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Even if you remove all the air and let it heat up, waves of radiation, similar to heat and light from the sun, are generated inside. Physicists in the early 1900s calculated the total energy of this radiation and got a strange answer. It seemed to be infinite for any chosen temperature. This didn't make sense because a hot oven can't have an infinite amount of energy. To explain this problem, physicists used Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, which showed that the waves in the oven had to fit between opposite surfaces in a certain way. These waves were described by terms like wavelength, frequency, and amplitude, Wavelength is the distance between wave peaks, frequency is the number of up and down cycles per second, and amplitude is the wave's maximum height or depth. Think of electromagnetic waves like the vibrations of a violin string. Different wave frequencies correspond to different musical notes, and the amplitude affects the volume of sound. Physicists discovered that all allowed waves in the oven, regardless of their wavelength, carried the same amount of energy determined by the oven's temperature. This seemed interesting at first, but it led to a big problem for classical physics. While the requirement for whole numbers of peaks and troughs ruled out many wave patterns, there were still infinitely many possible patterns. Since each pattern carried the same energy, the total energy became infinite. This posed a significant challenge to the physics of the time. 
In 1900, physicist Planck solved a tricky problem about infinite energy in ovens, earning him a Nobel Prize later. Imagine a large warehouse with a thermostat that charges based on the temperature setting. If set to 50 degrees, everyone pays $50 and so on. With an infinite number of people, this could lead to infinite payments. However, Planck cleverly suggested that energy, like money, comes in specific amounts or lumps. He compared it to a crowd dividing money denominations to avoid overpaying. Planck proposed that the energy in electromagnetic waves also comes in lumps, determined by their frequency. Waves with higher frequency have larger energy lumps, and this idea resolved the problem of infinite energy. Planck's calculations showed that this lumpiness led to a finite total energy, eliminating the absurdity of an infinite result. His guess gained credibility because it accurately matched experimental measurements. Planck introduced a constant, h-bar, to describe the proportionality between frequency and the energy lump size. This constant is incredibly small, explaining why we perceive continuous changes in wave energy when, in reality, it occurs in tiny, discrete steps. Planck's quantum theory not only explained oven energy but also challenged our fundamental understanding of the world, especially in the microscopic realm. The small value of his constant keeps most of these unusual behaviors confined to the tiny world of particles. If the constant were larger, strange events like those at the H-bar would be more common. Planck introduced the idea of lumpy energy in 1900, which seemed to work but had no clear explanation. In 1905, Einstein provided an explanation based on the photoelectric effect, winning a Nobel Prize in 1921. The photoelectric effect involves metals emitting electrons when hit by light. While increasing light intensity doesn't change electron speed, changing the light's frequency does. Einstein used an analogy with children in a basement paying an exit fee to explain the photoelectric effect. He proposed that light is a stream of tiny packets called photons. Each photon's energy is proportional to the light's frequency, following Planck's lead. If a photon has enough energy, it can knock an electron off a metal surface, similar to how children leave when they receive enough money. Just as more dollars mean more children leaving, more photons mean more electrons being ejected, the leftover energy of ejected electrons depends on the light's frequency, not its total intensity. Einstein's explanation aligned with experimental data, showing that light is composed of particles or quanta called photons, explaining the lumpy nature of energy in electromagnetic waves. While Einstein's insight was significant, the story continues with more complexities to explore. This idea isn't new, as Newton suggested it over 300 years ago, but others like Huygens argued that light is a wave. The double-slit experiment performed by Thomas Young showed that light behaves like a wave. In this experiment, light is shone on a barrier with two slits, and the resulting pattern on a photographic plate is observed. If only one slit is open, the light concentrates in one area, and the same happens if the other slit is open. If both are open, Newton's particle theory predicts a combined pattern, while the wave theory predicts an interference pattern. An analogy with water waves helps understand interference. When circular water waves from each slit overlap, peaks add up, troughs add up, and they cancel each other out, creating a pattern. The interference pattern seen in the double-slit experiment supports the wave theory. However, even firing individual photons through the slits resulted in an interference pattern over time. This strange behavior, where individual particles create wave-like patterns, shows that light has both particle and wave properties. This idea called wave-particle duality, is a fascinating aspect of the microscopic world that challenges our intuition. In the early 1900s, scientists were trying to understand the hidden aspects of tiny particles in the world. 
Niels Bohr made progress in explaining light from hot hydrogen atoms, but the ideas were not well organized, like Newton's laws or Maxwell's theory. In 1923, Prince Louis de Broglie suggested that inspired by Einstein's work, particles like electrons could have wave-like properties. This idea gained support when Clinton Davison and Lester Germer observed interference patterns in electron experiments. Similar to light wave patterns, de Broglie's idea was that particles, like electrons, could behave like waves. This strange concept was confirmed by experiments showing that even individual particles could create wave-like patterns over time. However, the wave-like nature of particles is not noticeable in everyday life due to the smallness of certain constants. Max Born later suggested a probabilistic interpretation of these waves, stating that they represent the likelihood of finding a particle at a certain location. This idea challenges our usual understanding of physics, where probability is usually due to incomplete information. Quantum mechanics introduces probability at a fundamental level, suggesting that at a microscopic level, particles exist in a probabilistic state. Scholars like Schrödinger and Born developed equations describing the probability waves, and experiments confirmed the predictions. By 1927, the classical view of a deterministic universe was replaced by a universe where precise outcomes are uncertain, governed only by probabilities. Some, like Einstein, found this probabilistic view uncomfortable, arguing that the universe should be predictable, not governed by chance. However, experiments consistently supported the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. Despite successful predictions, there's ongoing debate about what quantum mechanics truly means. The nature of probability waves, how particles choose paths, or whether parallel universes exist, are still open questions. Quantum mechanics teaches us that the fundamental principles of the universe can be stranger than our everyday experiences, urging us to be flexible in accepting unexpected answers. Richard Feynman, a brilliant physicist, had a unique way of looking at quantum mechanics, a theory explaining the behavior of tiny particles. While his ideas matched the predictions of earlier theories, his approach was different, especially in understanding the two-slit experiment with electrons. In the experiment, electrons create interference patterns, suggesting they pass through both slits, even when fired one by one. Other physicists explained this by associating a probability wave with each electron. Feynman, however, challenged the idea that each electron goes through just one slit. He argued that trying to observe which slit an electron goes through changes the experiment. Feynman proposed a mind-boggling idea. Each electron doesn't choose one path but takes all possible paths at the same time. It's as if the electron explores every route from the source to the screen simultaneously. This concept, known as Feynman's sum over paths, eliminates the need for a probability wave. Instead, the probability of an electron reaching a point on the screen comes from considering all possible ways it could get there. This might sound crazy from our everyday perspective, but quantum mechanics, the physics of the microscopic world, demands we accept such unusual ideas. Feynman's approach yields the same results as other methods, confirming the strangeness of nature at small scales. For larger objects like baseballs or airplanes, Feynman showed that his approach converges to the familiar, predictable trajectories dictated by Newton's laws of motion. This helps reconcile the peculiar behavior of tiny particles with our everyday experiences. Different physicists have various ways of explaining quantum mechanics, and Feynman's approach is just one of them. Even though they all predict the same outcomes, these approaches offer different ways of thinking about the mysterious world of quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, the way the universe operates is very different from what we're used to in our everyday lives.
One key idea is the uncertainty principle discovered by Werner Heisenberg in 1927. This principle tells us that when we try to measure the position of a tiny particle like an electron, it unavoidably affects its motion, and vice versa. Imagine you're trying to see something in the dark using a dim light. As you make the light dimmer, you might think you're being gentler in observing, but quantum mechanics tells us there's a limit to how gentle we can be. Using very low-energy light means fewer photons, and eventually, we can't make the light any dimmer without turning it off. So there's always a minimum disturbance we cause to the particle's motion when we measure its position. Heisenberg found a mathematical relationship showing that the more precisely we measure a particle's position, the less precisely we can know its velocity, and vice versa. This isn't just about a specific method, it's a fundamental fact for all particles. Even Albert Einstein, trying to maintain a more classical view, was proven wrong. Quantum mechanics revealed that particles, including electrons, can't be thought of as having definite positions and velocities simultaneously. This uncertainty becomes more apparent when we confine particles to smaller regions, causing their motion to become increasingly unpredictable. The uncertainty principle also leads to a phenomenon called quantum tunneling. In the world of tiny particles, like electrons, there's a chance they can temporarily penetrate barriers like walls, even if they don't have enough energy according to classical physics. This happens because, according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, particles can borrow energy for a short time, as long as they give it back quickly. This strange behavior challenges our common-sense notions, showing that what we consider basic like objects having precise positions and speeds, is more of an everyday scale illusion. When applied to the fabric of space-time, these quantum principles reveal imperfections in our understanding of gravity and lead to significant challenges in the field of physics.